All right, hi everybody. This is uh, Jenny, and my voice might sound a little bit different because I had my surgery today, and my voice is pretty hoarse. Anyways, it went well, but um, I know I really wanted to get all of the PowerPoints done for you so you could um, watch them. So this is on glutococorticoids, and I wanted you to take a look at this picture of the adrenal glands because the adrenal gland is responsible for the production of cortisol, which basically is what steroids are when you're giving steroids. It's basically giving um, cortisol, which is very similar to what your adrenal gland makes. So if you see the kidneys here, your adrenal glands sit on top of that. Um, they're responsible for other things. So I brought up a nice article here, but just in summary, it helps burn protein and fat. It reacts to stressors like major illnesses and injury. It helps regulate blood pressure also. So it makes two major hormones. It's responsible for producing two major hormones. That's aldosterone and cortisol. Aldosterone has to do with your blood pressure. And um, the adrenal glands also produce adrenaline and small amounts of sex hormones called androgens, among other hormones. So we were talking about the endocrine system before. Um, this is similar within the endocrine system, but we're really going to focus on cortisol. As you can imagine how uh, precise and how fine-tuned our body is and how complicated it is also. Um, all right, and so we will get started on the PowerPoint, and then I may add a few things in here and there, but I want you to get the understanding of where this cortisol is coming from. And when we're giving glucocorticoids, which is a steroid, we can see that sometimes there's some adverse reactions to it. So getting started here, let me get started on the slideshow. There we go. Oh, you know what? My screen to make it a little bit bigger here. Uh, it should work. Okay, let's try it again. I seem to have this problem. Hopefully it'll work. Okay, glucocorticoids and non-endocrine disorders. All right, so glu glucocorticoid drugs, that's your steroids, also known as corticosteroids, and nearly identical to the steroids produced in the adrenal cortex, which I showed you the adrenal gland sitting on top of the kidney. Well, if you dissect it, inside is the adrenal cortex. That's where the steroids are produced. Um, glucocorticoids, mineral corticoids, and sex hormones. So what this has, the physiology of this, it has basically multiple effects on the body. Metabolic effects, which we talked about, such as your blood sugars. Although, remember, the pancreas is the main focus, so we don't have any medications that will work with the adrenal glands. <clears throat> Cardiovascular effects, effects during stress. So anything during stress can bring your cortisol up, uh, usually up. If, you, if you've heard of uh, the obesity issue and some... Um, companies trying to come out with how cortisol is a main predictor of weight gain because you increase cortisol as you have stress so there's some stuff over the counter not sure if it's safe to help reduce that cortisol level it also has an effect on your water and electrolytes and the respiratory system and neonates so the pharmacology of these um, glucocorticoids <clears throat> The glucocorticoid receptors are inside the cell, and they um, modulate the production of regulatory proteins versus signaling pathways. So in, in layman's terms, what that means is glucocorticoid receptors, they stay inside the cell, and they modulate the production of the proteins that need to come in and out. So there's an effect on metabolism and electrolytes, anti-inflammatory and immunosuppressant effects. Um, so in addition to having effects on metabolism and electrolytes, there's also some adverse reactions that can happen too, or maybe not so good reactions that we want to have or things, such as the immunosuppressant effects. And we'll go through that in just a little bit. So some um, uses that we use it for is rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, inflammatory bowel disease, and other inflammatory disorders. It's really used for a lot of things. If someone comes in with an asthma exacerbation, we'll give them some steroids. Someone has um, 
Sometimes some hives that won't go away, we may give them a dose of steroids, although that's a more last case scenario. Um, you can give it, although it's recommended that you give the histamine blockers first before you uh, go to those. Um, and when you think of glucocorticoids or steroids, think of it as like a, it's not an aspirin, it's not an anti-inflammatory, but think of it as a super-powered Super-powered anti-inflammatory, that's the best way I can say it, because it really helps calm things down in your body when it's having a reaction to things um, such as asthma exacerbation, which is mentioned here in asthma, allergic conditions, dermatologic disorders. If You know, there's a million and one creams out there that are steroid creams that can help calm things down, neoplasms, or um, um, abnormal uh, cancerous uh, things, um, suppression of rejection, and um, prevention of respiratory distress syndrome. So we talked about the immunosuppressants before with the organ rejection, and I mentioned glucocorticoids in there. So it's brought up again in here. Uh, so anyways, <clears throat> with all of these things come long-term side effects like for example with dermatological disorders you don't want to be using the cream for a long period of time that can cause skin thinning stretch marks um, and just not good for the skin so two weeks maximum is usually what we say for uh, these steroid creams now they come in low dose and high dose there's all different doses for uh, the creams for these um, skin issues uh, so what you can always do is have them on it twice a day for two weeks, then down to two days a week, then once a week. And again, um, there's some that are, have more potency than others, some have been studied a little bit more than others, some that are safer than others. Asthma and allergies, um, there's the steroid inhalers, uh, there's multiple steroid inhalers out as well as um, oral um, <clears throat> steroids, which will give to patients that have an exacerbation of asthma that are already taking steroids, or if they have more of an emergency, they cannot catch their breath, their um, peak flow is not very good, and then we will give them the oral steroids to kick it in and hopefully help their breathing within the next 24 hours. So as far as some adverse effects, now, when we go think back to the picture I showed you of the adrenal glands, so what could have happened is your adrenal glands um, make cortisol for multiple reasons in your body. But what happens is if you're taking steroids for too long of a time, you have a chance of getting what's called Cushing syndrome, which is an overproduction of cortisol. It's too much in your body. So you can get a lot of um, different symptoms. You can feel emotionally disturbed, you gain weight, you get the buffalo hump. And I know I talked about this at, in some other um, uh, slides back in um, uh, the other lectures. Um, so you can have thin wrinkled skin, stop your period, some muscle weakness, some purpura, skin ulcers. Uh, so, and you get hyper <clears throat> cardiac hypertrophy, which is hypertension. If you look, look at the moon faces, the buffalo humps here, and then this is the moon face. It gets real round and puffy. So this is Cushing syndrome. In addition, you'll see a lot of um, stretch marks here because they gain weight really fast. Um, and it divides it up. Um, I think this, yeah, it talks about the men and then the women. So males can get hypogynecomastia. Um, everybody has increased susceptibility to infection because it can lower your immune system. So although it's a good drug, you have to be very careful because it can cause adrenal suppression. It can mess up that whole cycle. Some other adverse effects are cataracts, glaucoma, peptic ulcer disease, and the Cushing's, which I talked about. Now, say that um, your body doesn't produce cortisol at all in your adrenal glands. Well, that's called Addison's disease. That can be very life-threatening, so you have to take steroids for the rest of your life because your body needs the steroid or the cortisol in order uh, for your body to function. 
So you don't have to know about that, but I just want you to have an idea of sort of the, the adrenal gland and what happens if you have too much steroid versus no steroid. So if your adrenal gland is making enough of the cortisol, which is your steroid, and then you're adding other steroids on top of it, you have that risk of Cushing syndrome. But the opposite would be if your body's not making any cortisol, that would be Addison's disease, where you actually need to take the uh, steroids. <clears throat> Sorry for my voice. Okay, so um, as far as drug interactions, there's interactions related to potassium loss, NSAIDs, uh, just because, you know, think of the steroids, like I said, a super-powered anti-inflammatory. So you have to be careful when you're mixing the two drugs together. Insulin and oral hypoglycemics, um, it's most likely because, remember I said that the adrenal glands do have something to do with um, your blood sugar control, so you have to just be careful. And vaccines. Now, these interactions does not necessarily mean that they're not going to be on these. You may see this, but you just have to be really cautious of that. These are absolute contraindications, though. So you already have a lowered immune system. So if you have a systemic fungal infection, which is most likely from the long-term use of these steroids, you want to taper down on those or stop them. What's really challenging is that People that take these long term for their autoimmune issues or their rheumatoid arthritis or their um, lupus or whatnot. So you don't really want to stop it immediately. You want to do a taper off um, because it's going to um, exacerbate their pain. So you have to be real careful with these. Um, and all of these symptoms, remember I talked about at one point you have short term side effects of glucocorticoids or steroids, and then you have long-term effects. So people that take them for short-term, if I give you a short burst of prednisone, um, let's say for example I had this sinus surgery and I have five days worth that I'm supposed to take, the side effects that I'm going to get are more jitteriness, thirsty, hungry, pain because I'm thirsty, anxiety, Hopefully, I don't get that. I already have enough of that. Um, so those are short-term side effects. You're really not going to have the risk of the adrenal um, issues um, of Cushing's and things like that. It's when you're on this long-term use of steroids, it's going to reduce your immune system, and you have to really be careful. So since it does decrease your immune system, remember anything with a live virus vaccine, you want to be careful and not give if they're taking long-term steroids. Also with pregnancy and breastfeeding and use with caution in pediatric patients. So usually unless, um, you know, you're weighing the risks and the benefits, if they're having a severe asthma attack, uh, <clears throat> you probably will need to be giving uh, some steroid to a pediatric patient because you need them to breathe, right? But yet if it's mild, we try to hold off on that um, and try other measures. They can do a nebulizer treatment, so that's really common. And watch out with pregnancy and breastfeeding. And I already talked about adrenal suppression, so this is kind of um, a review. Why can it develop, which I already said why it could develop. Um, you have an overproduction of um, the um, cortisol, um, or stress can do it too. And I talked about the weight gain people. Are, it's known that we do have increased cortisol with stress, um, and then that causes us to weight, gain weight in the middle, like more of an apple shape. You can also have some adrenal suppression with withdrawal, which I mentioned you have to be careful when you're taking people off of these medications. So the routes of these are oral, parenteral, so IV, IM, sub-Q, and topical. Uh, they've been out for a long time, so there's multiple ways to give them. Uh, they, individual ones, though, they each differ in certain ways, such as the half-life, potency um, of the mineral corticoid or the glucocorticoid. So it just depends what the makeup is of that specific corticoid, which, um, in other words, steroid. Okay. All right, so a few um, tidbits that I want to mention and I feel is important to talk about. Um, hint, hint, right? 
um, is let's talk about what happens also long term when you're taking a steroid or glucocorticoid. What can happen um, to your bones? You can have some bone loss. So that's why if people that are taking long-term inhalers for their asthma, COPD, um, oral <clears throat> steroids, you want to get bone densities. You want to make sure that these people are taking calcium and vitamin D supplements. Remember what's known, um, or I'm not sure if you've learned this already, but um, in order for calcium to absorb, you really need to have an adequate vitamin D level. That's why calcium and vitamin D is very important. <clears throat> so to minimize the risk of osteoporosis, it's calcium and vitamin D supplements. Um, we did talk about estrogen therapy. These are more so um, postmenopausal, like we talked about for the last section, um, but we're talking about someone um, that's maybe postmenopausal, um, but is on a um, glucocorticoid or maybe going to start one. You really want to make sure we're thinking prevention, right? We're thinking, um, well, let's just not throw you on estrogen now. You may be doing okay, but just, just make sure you're taking your calcium and vitamin D supplements. There's no, um, it's not necessary to get x-rays before or start estrogen at this point. Um, or even get a baseline vitamin D level, because regardless, they're going to be needing to take the calcium with vitamin D. Most calcium has the vitamin D in it already, but sometimes it's just not enough. So I usually recommend 1 to 2,000 units a day, although there's not any um, specific guidelines that say how much you should be taking of vitamin D. Uh, there's also calcium. The recommended is 1,000 to 1,200 milligrams a day of calcium. The jury is kind of out with that now just because we've been showing that there's been some calcium buildup in arteries in your heart. And so is calcium bad for you? I don't know. Right now we're just kind of, the jury's out, the waters are muddied with, mud, muddied with this, that's what we call it. And Right now we're still recommending it because we know it's for your bones. If they're not getting it in their diet, then you'd recommend a supplement. But if somebody, let's just say someone's not taking a steroid at all, you'd probably have them supplement themselves with their diet. But since this patient is going on a steroid, we know it can cause bone loss, then you want them to take the supplement calcium with vitamin D. So when you're comparing glucocorticoids, let's remember I said that they're like super-powered anti-inflammatories. Well, they are two separate uh, types of drugs, although they work in maybe some similarities and multi many things not, but they are an anti-inflammatory. But when you think about side effects, there's many more side effects in the steroids than there would be in any anti-inflammatory. Why do we give one versus the other? Well, it just depends. So if somebody has an, um, a disorder such as rheumatoid arthritis, sorry if you hear noise, my husband turns on the movie <laughs> in the other room and it was loud. Okay, so anyways, um, and I'll yell at him if it was too distracting, so just tell me. <laughs> He won't hear me if I yell right now, and I can't yell. <laughs> so anyways, glucocorticoids have fewer side effects than non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Is that true or false? That's false. They have more side effects than anti-inflammatory drugs. Anti-inflammatory drugs um, are usually used for anti-inflammatories and more minor things, whereas the glucocorticoids are used for more serious stuff such as your asthma, COPD, emphysema, <clears throat> rheumatoid arthritis, as well as a, um, acute things such as my nasal surgery <laughs> to keep things, the swelling down, basically. That's what that does. So we talked about tapering off these steroids and how you have to be very careful. So when I say taper off, you don't want to taper off you know, half pill every other day or anything like that. It, I mean, it's more serious than that because what you're really messing with the adrenal glands and it's cortisol that the adrenal glands producing. So you don't want to mess that up. 
Um, it can suppress the whole adrenal function. So you have to do it really, really slow. It can take months uh, to uh, withdraw um, them from um, <clears throat> steroids. And you can always and should have their cortisol levels monitored to determine when therapy may be stopped. Um, so again, it may take several months. Patients who have stopped the drug may still experience adrenal insufficiency in times of stress and surgery. So let's just say, because I work in the pre-op world, I do pre-op um, physicals and make sure people are set for surgery. We have patients a lot of times that come in and are on chronic prednisone, which is a steroid, and I tell them that they have to do stress dose steroid, uh, or stress steroid dosing um, peri and post-operatively. Um, just because they can go in to mess up their adrenals, um, and we don't want that to happen. So um, they have to be really careful. So during surgery, whether they have to give some IV steroids or after surgery, it just depends what the dose they're on and how long and what they're on it for. Okay, and next on steroids. Uh, when taken in uh, pharmacologic doses, meaning the right doses uh, for inflammatory disorders, these steroids can cause a lot of serious side effects. So I know I keep drilling that in your mind, but just so you know that. So when it's given in pharmacologic doses, any, any type of dose, side effects can occur. Even when the drug is taken as prescribed, it still can cause um, side effects. So it needs to just be taken as prescribed and you need to monitor the patient. Um, interruption of the inflammatory process can cause some adverse effects, which is why you have to be careful about withdrawing. And um, <clears throat> side effects can occur and are dependent on the dose and duration of treatment. So if someone's on it for five days, the side effects are going to be different than if you're on it long term. So I'm going to give you a little question here to think about. So let's just say uh, Mary comes in. I don't know why I use Mary a lot. I should name Thelma. All right, Thelma's coming in, and she has some pain in her leg, and um, you realize that she has some um, bursitis in her right hip. And um, so what <clears throat> you think that you could do is maybe you can give her a steroid, not sure, but you need to look at the patient's medical history. So you look at her medical history, and it looks like she has a history of um, some gout. Uh, she's had some um, uh, dermatitis. She's had asthma, and she's had a systemic fungal infection. So are there any of these choices that would make you think, hmm, maybe we should stay away from steroids? So if you don't, look back and find a slide. You can pause this and look back. But if you don't feel like it, the answer is systemic fungal infection. Remember, we mentioned that in another slide. Glucocorticoids are contraindicated in patients with a history of systemic fungal infections. Glucocorticoids are used to treat asthma, allergic rhinitis, gout, and seborrheic dermatitis. So anybody with a skin disorder, gout, asthma, as you should already know, but I like to do repetitive because I feel that repetitive speaking gets it into more of your long-term memory. <clears throat> Actually, that's a known fact. Okay, so just make sure uh, that you know that. So one thing I'd like you to do, though, is make sure you go back and look at the slide whoop, right here and these two slides so you can see exactly um, what some of the adverse effects are. Because many times what you need when patients come in, you have to think if they're taking these, what kind of symptoms are they going to have? So you need to ask them if they're having any issues with any of this stuff. So more so, they probably wouldn't tell you, yeah, I have personality changes, but they will tell you I've gained weight and it's driving me nuts. <laughs> um, that's normal. Sometimes they can have weakness in your arms and legs, um, so um, in the upper arms and legs. <clears throat> Although there's osteoporosis, there's also some muscle 
um, changes that can happen. So let's see if it's on this one. Yep, muscle weakness. So it can cause, which I did say that before, muscle weakness. Um, so if somebody comes in and they're having muscle weakness, um, what do you want to do? What would be your first thing to do? If you um, are in a hospital setting and you know that they're on these long term and they're saying, gosh, my muscles are hurting in my arm, I'm feeling kind of weak, my legs hurt. It's, it's, it's not a trick question, but kind of a trick question. What are you going to do? You're going to call the doctor, right? And let them know. So it's probably, that means that it warrants a phone call to the doctor. <clears throat> so while it is, um, we could call it a side effect, effect, it's really more of an adverse effect, and we don't want that to happen. So and there's really not too much you can do about it at this point, um, except um, let the doctor know, and they're going to have to either adjust the dose, but you don't want to stop taking the drug. Remember, that takes months to do, <coughs> and you wouldn't be doing that anyways. Um, and there, it has nothing to do really with um, 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 electrolytes. If they're having water retention, yes, you would have them maybe reduce their sodium, but otherwise that has nothing to do with it. So for this one, you would um, ask the provider, and maybe he'll reduce the dose. And anybody who's been taking a glucocorticoid or a steroid for several months really needs to have their electrolytes monitored um, <clears throat> because they can have issues with their sodium levels um, and other electrolytes, uh, calcium and that kind of thing. So you want to make sure that they get serum electrolytes, especially if they start having symptoms um, because if they're on steroids and all of a sudden they're gaining a lot of weight, their cheeks are fuller, um, they're presenting with that hump on the back, you're thinking, hmm, do they have Cushing syndrome from the use of steroids? And so you want to get electrolytes on them. Okay, and lastly, let's talk about, let's try to weed some things out on who should be treated with steroids. Um, so remember, anybody... I think of it as a superpowered anti-inflammatory and things that respond to it it's more of a po more potent drug so you could treat it for allergic rhinitis give them just a short dose of steroids or remember with allergic rhinitis there's the steroid nasal sprays like Flonase, um, Viramis, there's a whole bunch of them out there now some are most are over the counter so you can use glucocorticoids for that um, gout. Um, for gout, remember, I don't know if you've learned about gout yet, but gout is an overproduction of uric acid. Um, that's just the, that is the most common cause of gout, and so you get the uric acid collecting in your joints. It can, can, it can cause severe, severe pain. And prednisone is one um, first-line therapy that you can choose, other than some of the other drugs. Um, but yes, you can give prednisone for that. And any type of autoimmune disease, inflammatory disorder, such as Crohn's disease, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, ulcerative colitis. So, for example, remember we were talking about antihistamines and things like that. So what if someone had anaphylaxis? What would be the best drug for that? Would it be a steroid? Probably not. It would be more of an epinephrine because remember it's really working with the leukotrienes of that allergic response. Could it be used for bronchitis or inflammation of the bronchioles? It's probably not the best choice. Usually those are viral. Um, if it was more of an asthma issue where there's spasming in the bronchioles, yes, you could use it, but not for just some inflammation of the bronchioles. Um, that's probably not the most beneficial. Okay, and that wraps up uh, glucocorticoids.